Well, hello there. It's your pal, Mike Squires. This is the Couchrist Podcast. Once again, with episode number 255. And my guest this episode is Mark Emmert Hutner, the lead singer slash guitar player for a band called Sugar Tooth. Now, Sugar Tooth is a band, had a record deal in the 90s, hit the road hard, toured their asses off, and like a lot of bands, like most bands, it didn't hit big. So, I mean, that's bad. It's been the case with all my bands, but every once in a while, someone does it. And so we keep doing it. We keep doing it. Bands keep doing it. Sugar Tooth uh, went on hiatus, and Mark played guitar for the band Pleasure Club fucking amazing band toured a bunch with them and in fact played some shows just uh, right before covid when uh covid hit mark uh was in a documentary about 90s bands and was inspired to finish his sugar tooth story so sugar tooth in 2023 they released three singles sing on I've Been What You've Become and Buried. And on April 21st, they will release... Well, they they already released. I'm recording this ahead of time, sorry. On April 21st, they will release Volume 3, their third full-length album. Uh, I've heard a bunch of it. It's killer. If you are a fan of a very groovy, heavy rock, you will love it. What can I say? Also, Mark has a house down the road, so I get to see him every once in a while. Hang out. It's great hang out with him and his family the world is super small the world is so small so small with that we have a bunch of crossover we talk about that in the podcast i hope you enjoyed this episode as much as i did go check out sugar tooth's music go listen to pleasure club also fucking also amazing and um listen to volume three because it's great i want to thank mark for stopping by and hanging out with me thank you so much i want to thank everyone for listening if you are enjoying the couchers podcast and or the cover song videos that Couchriffs produces, please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Couchriffs. That is what makes this happen. And I can't say thank you enough. It means a lot. And it was actually going to mean everything very soon. I would love to be able to invest twice as much of my time and energy into Couchriffs and give you more, better and more better stuff. More stuff, better stuff, and more better stuff. That's it. I do have a couple other folks that I would like to thank. I would like to thank Variety Coffee Roasters in Brooklyn, New York. Variety is a, as I said, well, you could probably put it together. They're a coffee roaster in Brooklyn. They have a few cafes in Brooklyn. They have a number of cafes in Manhattan. If you don't live in either of those boroughs or anywhere in New York, go to varietycoffeeroasters.com. Order their coffee online. They have a great line of merch, shirts, hats, mugs, travel mugs, kill a bunch of great stuff. If you enjoy the coffee that you drink there, or if you simply trust my opinion, I'm a coffee professional. Did you know this? I order coffee from Variety for my work, which produce hundreds of gallons of coffee. So if that tells you how much I trust and enjoy these guys' coffee. If that tells you anything and you trust my word, then go buy some of their coffee. What are you fucking waiting for? They have a subscription service. Click a couple buttons. It'll ask you, what do you like? How often do you want it? And then it'll just show up. You never run out of coffee. It's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. Variety Coffee Roasters, I love you. Thank you so much for supporting Couchress. We're going to jump into the episode, okay? Don't forget the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's not that hard. It's a lot easier to treat people kindly than to be a dick. And don't just don't be that. Mark, I'm so happy to see you. I'm so happy. I'm so Uh, flattered to be asked. It's so it's uh, it's funny that we because the world is so small, right? Um. You and your wife moved just down the road from us, and I would have likely never met you. Um, but I talked to your wife at the Sunny Day Real Estate show, and she was like, me and my husband bought a house uh, up in the Hudson Valley because I was talking about Hudson. 
And, uh, and I was like, mm-hmm. that's crazy. Where do you, well, you know, where are you guys at? And, and it was just like, holy shit, you guys are down the road. Um, and then I didn't, I still didn't know anything about you. And then it turns out that at one point you tried to help one of my former bands get a record deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we go way back and we didn't even know it. You imagine how thrilled I was to have my wife come home from and say, I met a guy backstage. He's great. And I got his number. <laughs> um, but yeah, you and I have uh, a lot of touch points going back to the Nevada Bachelors, going back to Ugly Kid Joe, Joy, you know, Kushner. Kate Fortman, Kushner. Brian, I mean, there, it's like how we how we haven't met until this year or the end of last year is ridiculous. I'm, but I'm glad this is, we did. It's one of those moments where I'm so grateful that the world is so small. True. true. How do you? Um, before we start digging in, how do you like to have a little a place in the country that you can like a little escape? Do you? Does that bring you joy and happiness? Um, yeah, it does. I think it brings me more joy than it does my wife. Um, uh, it, you know, being in Manhattan, I love Manhattan and I moved here because I loved Manhattan and, um, it, it, in many ways, it offers me everything that I want in a day-to-day life. I like, um, I like noise. I like being around people. I like action and activity. I find the suburbs utterly isolating and depressing. Um, and I love the idea that even if I've never done it, which I still have never done it, if I wanted Indian food <laughs> at four in the morning, I could get it within a few you know, steps you of my still? apartment. That brings me some. I think you can. I mean, it's probably not going to be the best Indian food, but, you know, there are still pockets of, uh, of 24-7 Manhattan. Um, but – the um we uh we it's nice to have an escape hatch at the same time particularly when when covid kicked in and uh we found ourselves uh confined to an apartment with a child and that was me (laughs) uh no my son and uh you know so we we bought we bought the house as an escape and it's become like an opportunity for me to have like a room you've been in the room but it's it's um a room or or it's just mine and it's it's about music whether it's the instruments or listening to music or whatever it's there's just no distractions it's all music and it's uh kind of a first time in my life where i've actually had something like that so i love it and i i I do really appreciate the quiet um of it up there but i don't know how i'd feel about it if that was my my day to day, every day. I like, I like that. It's an escape. The, um, if a future civilization found that place, they would be, they would probably think what kind of tomb is this? It's full of so many treasures. So, so many similar treasures. <laughs> oh, many treasures. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to actually take this laptop on a quick journey. Cause I just realized you that, need to um, take a poop. I won't be alone for a while. <laughs> I'm going to go in the other room so that when my wife and oh, son yeah. do come home, I still have silence. Wait a minute. They let you hang all those guitars up in the living room? They do? Can you imagine? You, when you see the bedroom. They yeah. let you do that. <laughs> they, they That's incredible. Choice. They don't have a choice. I mean, oh, oh look. Oh, look. We're oh, in another room. That ML. That's hot. That in blue burst room. ML is something. We're in another room. <laughs> yeah, it's bonkers in this house. But that's what I got myself into. Okay. What a, Here I go. What a life. Now. What a wonderful life. Um, okay. So you you are happily residing in, in New York now, but where are you from? Where did where were you born and where did you grow up? Uh I was born in Inglewood, oh. California, raised in uh San Fernando Valley in Northridge. Um, um and uh was part of the whole music scene in LA from as early as I can remember. Um, and didn't know that I 
wasn't so keen on it until I left and had more perspective when I moved to Manhattan and uh, I was able to look back and be like, I wasn't really meant for right. LA. Were uh, being born in LA, growing up in LA, were your parents in the entertainment industry? No, no sir. Um, my father was a door to door salesman, uh -huh. an insurance salesman. And my mother was a Did, high I school hope teacher. He was selling earthquake insurance. <laughs> he probably was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, he um, he worked in in really tough neighborhoods um, in Pacoima and San Fernando. Um, tough, tough. You know, he witnessed people getting shot Ooh. and killed, and you know, it was uh, it was not the life right. that he had wanted. Um, he was a, he was a, um, he, he was fancied himself a drummer and, uh, his father was not supportive of him doing anything musically unless it was piano. Cause it was all about the high arts. And so when I started showing interest in music, he didn't care what instrument it was. Like he was like, I uh, do it, do it. So I, I was, I was supported musically as, again, as early as I can remember. That's a, I mean, that's crucial that's um that's amazing and super cool that you had the support of your dad especially because he did not have that did you ever jam with him no uh you know he never had a drum set it was all about like table pounding yeah. and you know, you know as we do and you know and uh, he played guitar a little bit he strummed guitar um he a fascinating man if i do say so myself but he um I'm okay. gonna shut these windows. He was a New York native. He was born in uh, Rochester, New York, and um, the loudest city in the world. He was born in Rochester, New York, and um, moved around and like a New York Jew. And he, when he moved to L.A., he. As a kid, he was a rebel. He was a high school dropout. He is a, a Jewish guy. He got a, a, a crucifix tattoo on him when he was a kid. So one, tattoos are not supposed to happen when you're Jewish. Two, crucifix, certainly not supposed to happen. Huge rebel. And he used to get them by taking, <laughs> yeah, he used to take trips into Tijuana and get tattooed and hookers and the whole thing. But as a kid, he found, he, he, just, he saw a movie, a Mexican movie, and or a movie about like Mexican Mexicans. And uh, there was a moment or a few moments in the film, which were uh, serenading, you know, mariachi bands. And he absolutely flipped out over that music. And he went and bought a record, came home, memorized, like learned it. And he became fluent in Spanish, such, I mean, just fluent in Spanish based on his ingestion of mariachi music. And when he met my mom, who is, was, was still, you know, fully Mexican, he fooled her into thinking that he was a Spaniard because he spoke so well. So when she started dating him, she was dating him under the pretense that he was Latin. Um, and, uh, but anyway, I just, again, a, a fascinating character, but he, uh, music and, uh, you know, certainly Mexican music was a huge part of their um, yeah. relationship and their loves. And it was definitely part of my growing up and, uh, it, you know, the, the, the guitar. So anyways, he would strum the guitar and they would do, they would duet together and he would do the falsettos and it was, you know, it was just, it was. So was there was music lovely. in the house happening as from your earliest, earliest memories. Yes, absolutely. Uh, rec records, eight and, tracks. It was just but, music. But also the whole music time. being they performed. It. Yep, they would have uh, they would have parties. You know, loved it when we were kids. My sister and I, they, we had parties, and all their friends would come over, and they would be musicians, and and it was almost exclusively Mexican music. Um, and there would be, you know, it wasn't quite mariachi bands, but there would be musicians and it would, you know, there was tequila flowing and it was, uh, it was a big to do. And, and, uh, it was, it was awesome. But that was, that, those are really early memories. It and they, sounds awesome. And, uh, yeah. So when, did, yeah. <laughs> when were you, I mean, clearly the, you, you were bit by the bug and, and it, you never got the, 
you, ne you were never vaccinated. You have a lot of guitars. When were you bit by the bug? And when did you decide like, oh, maybe I'll try and pick that thing up? Do you remember specifically? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I, I know that I love music going in. And I remember one, like one, I forget maybe fourth grade or something. My sister bought me a Pat Benatar cassette oh, crimes of yeah. passion and i remember listening before i was going to school and i loved hells for children and, and uh I, I loved it but i loved it as a spectator and then um i think it was somewhere around 11 years old i, I kind of wanted to pick up the guitar there were acoustics laying around and my dad gave me lessons and i started on drums and guitar so i was taking both lessons and um Drums came a little bit more naturally to me, um, but um, but eventually, I mean, who the hell, you know, come home, it's too challenging to like practice drums when you're living in a, I don't know, it, guitar was much right. more reasonable. And, uh, you know, and once you mastered like the bar chord, you could effectively stop taking lessons and you're off and running. So I think the lazy ADHD part of me right. just went for that. And um, it's probably about 11 years old. So you're 11. We're about the same age, right? Born in 71. Yeah. So yeah, you, I'm, I'm you're, are you listening to, are you just listening to the music that you're hearing at home? Are you absorbing music at school and, and from the radio and MTV and stuff? Because it's about to change. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was radio. It was KMET, KLOS in LA as a kid. Um, Beatles. I think when I first started playing guitars, it was like on top of Old Smokey, and it was the Beatles and you know like pretty basic uh, chord stuff. And then, um, I would look at like kids in my school, and they would have like the peachy folders, and I would like the cool kids with oh, yeah. bands on it. So I started, I started getting acquainted with bands by their name, but not really knowing what they sound like. So I kind of would copy them. And I had like ACDC and never heard of them, heard them really, but ACDC and Queen, and whatever the bands were of that era, I, my peachy folder looked like that. And then on uh, maybe my 12th birthday, I might have it. It might've been 10 when I started and maybe it was my 11th birthday. And I got um, a, a gift certificate to warehouse records and tapes for like, Christmas or birthday or something. And I went down to the record store that would have been my very first purchase. And it was my foray really into the rabbit hole of, of, of music that I wanted. And so I picked, I'm not even quite sure why this of all the records, but it was my gateway drug. It was queen. The okay. game. And I still have that very same piece of vinyl. Um, and it just changed my life and it changed my life, not only because of the insane music that was being, you know, coming out of the speakers, but the tactile experience of holding it, looking at the pictures, reading the lyrics, who's the engineer, like all the thank you. Like, it became like this puzzle that drew me in. And then it was, it was like nonstop. It was ACDC and, 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 and all that. Um, and it was great in the seventies. There were, there were like, it was genre -less. It was just like, it was music. It, was, it didn't matter what it was. It was just all on the same radio. But when I, that that's became, when I started becoming more, certainly more active in it. But when I completely like, this is my life, it was a combination of, there were three moments that I can recall. It was, um, Adam and the Ants, uh, I'm actually wearing an Adam and the Ants shirt. Adam and the Ants, Kings of the Wild Frontier. Yeah. I had a neighbor down the street, I just th the cool, the cool stoner troublemaker kid, punk. He loved punk. Uh, he turned me on to Adam and the Ants, and it was Kings of the Wild Frontier, and I'd never heard anything like it. And it was the single stand and deliver. I'd never seen a band look like that. The second time, you know, and I'm still loving ACDC and Pink Floyd. But and the second time that I just like, holy shit, it, it was David Bowie. And um, my, I took the bus down to a shopping center and with my grandmother on probably my 12th birthday or something like that, again, to buy a record. I don't know why, but I picked Scary <laughs> Monsters. Yeah. And, you know, um, of all the Bowie records That's to start with. That's the oddball. 
it's it's not user friendly. I mean, there's some amazing moments, but it's not. It's like reading a Joan Didion book. book is your first <laughs> like, attempt at reading. You know, um, it was so esoteric, but it was so the production was so insane. Like it felt like this maniacal clown was coming out of the speaker. Was, is he straight? Is he gay? Is he human? Is he alien? I don't know what the fuck is going on, but I want in. So it was, it was just like these larger than life personas of Adam and the ants and Bowie. And I was just like, there's nothing else that interests me in life. Like I, I, I need to be this. I need to be one. I need to be. Were a you a shitty role. student? Yeah. Um, Again, you know, I, I referenced it earlier. I think we talked about it, but I later, much later in life, as in only a couple of years ago, I got diagnosed with a really high degree of ADHD. And um, it explains a lot. We could talk about my musical journey, but um, yeah, school was really tough for me because I, I don't naturally have the bandwidth to really stay focused. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And, and, and then as, Consequently, I started daydreaming. And so, you know, my school hours were spent coming up with lyrics and album covers and, you know, what's my stage name going to be, you know, you know, whatever. So start think, writing your own band yeah, name. I did my PC. best writing. Did you have fa favorite doodles you would put on? I would always turn the tennis racket into a guitar. Because yeah, never, uh, it know, wasn't that bright. It seems so obvious now. It never even occurred to me now. And um, the the relay runners that baton was always a bathroom pass <laughs> always yeah, it was a classy year totally class <laughs> um when did you start playing with other people did, did that happen in school were you in music programs and no mm -mm. uh it was in school i i i I, to this day, I, I can't read music. Um, I know the difference between a major and minor chord, uh, but that literally that's about the extent of it. I couldn't tell you what a major seven or a minor seven or a diminished or augmented, whatever the hell is, not a clue. Um, so it made jazz band sure. really challenging. Um, but I did in seventh grade, I assembled a band with um, kids in my school I, th I uh, didn't make any sense, but I think they were, one was two of them. One was a jock. One was like the, 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 the cool kid, the, the, the popular kid. One was, they were all kind of in that world. I think they had money, which is why probably I, I went to them because they right. had instruments. So I assembled a band and we, I called it images and I was a guitar player, singer, the, my friend's friend, Steve was the drummer and, Jeff was the keyboard player and Tony was a bit, I mean, terrible, but, uh, I managed to get them to t how I did it. You know, I talked them all into going into, I'd figured out that there must be places where you could go and there's PA systems. And I, I went through the yellow pages. I found there's a rehearsal space, never heard of it. What is a rehearsal space? I call, uh, we, can we just show up and you, you, pl you plugs, you have amps and we could sing and there's something you could hear it. And so images went to, uh, uh, I forget the name of it. It was in North Hollywood. And, you know, my parent, my dad dropped us off. And we had a, a, my first, a first official like band practice in our studio in seventh grade. That was my, and then it ended there. And you guys had but, no idea um, of how to operate the PA. Did anyone help you in that? Did, did, did oh, someone walk in and say, hey, this I, is. They probably did. They, they probably did. I, I mean, someone, yeah, because I wouldn't have known what to do. But I, we didn't really have any songs. You know, we, we I think we did a, a couple songs that we had, we had one or two songs and we did a cover, but that was it. And it was a, it was an opportunity for me to put on makeup and try and look yeah. like uh, Adam Ant and one of my capizios and jump around with these people awesome. that wanted nothing to do with me. Um, yeah. But, uh, it, but it went from there um, living in, in the suburbs and, and uh, f feeling isolated and, 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 uh, you know, all, all again, all those people were jocks and, and, and just, I it was not me. And so I didn't really have any, any, um, friends that were musicians or anyone that like fantasized about any of that stuff. And so I, I had to really make, make it up on my own. And so there, it was a lot of recording at home with the drum set and like two boom boxes and bouncing recordings of off, you know, that acoustic, you know, the drill. And then I remember when K-Rock was, they had a, uh, 
KROQ in LA, they had a uh, battle of the bands and you could submit. And so I, I did it all uh, on a, I think it was an eight track, me on the drums, me on the, every, every, everything. It was a terrible song, but I, you know, I had my mom drop me off at K rock and I hand delivered this reel to reel and I, anything I could do to get my, you know, figure this thing out. How, but I, my parents didn't, nobody knew. So it was, and there was no internet and it was like, all I had was the yellow pages and like MTV and I, I had to somehow make it work. Um, There's a wide gap between the I yellow did. pages and MTV that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> there is. <laughs> It certainly is. Uh, what about when you when you were in in high school? Did were you playing in a band at that point? No, uh, my first band was right at the end of high school. Um, it was it was a band it was a band called Hard Comfort. <laughs> um, which is a terrible name, but it was like, we were uh, the the drummer had come up with it. Yeah. But it was like, you know, iron butterfly, Led Zeppelin, you know, it was kind of, uh, uh." um, and I was just a guitar player and there was a singer bass player and, and uh, it was a three, a a trio. And then the bass player singer was awful. I think we, we fired him and we got a new bass player, but then I was, I was left as a singer. Um, I've never thought of myself as a singer. I've always thought of myself as a guitar player, um, I ended up singing because again, being, being alone and how do you make it? You, well, I, I'm the only person here, so I have to sing. And I'm also a bit, um, controlling. So it made more sense that like, uh, I, these are, I know, I know how it's supposed to go, but I'm not a singer and I can't, you know, I've got no vibrato to speak of. I got no, I can't hit scales. I've got, I've got a one octave range or whatever, you know? So, but it is what it is. I made it work. Um, but I definitely uh, um, um, identify myself as a, a, a right. guitar player, not, not a singer. So did Hard Comfort do any recordings? Do you have any recordings of that band? Um, oh, yeah, we have the terrible demos, terrible demos. You know, it's so it's painful to listen to now, but but it's, it's also, you know, uh, it was the process. And uh, I was really... I mean, I have like a, I have a pretty high octave. I think um, yeah. Ozzy is sort of, you know, early Black Sabbath. That's sort of the range that I naturally sing in. But, you know, at 18, I didn't have any sort of rasp. And so I was manufacturing the rasp and I was, I, I more sounded like I was right. trying to be Lemmy, but it was just so unnatural and I would blow my voice out. It was, it was it's painful to listen to, but that was my yeah. attempt at sounding tough. Was it, um, uh, was it a precursor to to Sugar Tooth sounding? Was it like uh, vaguely uh, stoner rock? We're talking 1988. No. That wasn't the most like you know popular genre at the time, but it was a you know it was about to start growing. Yeah, well, I think well the Hard Comfort Band was you know to be. Our goal was to sound like Grand Funk, Grand Funk, um, Funk Humble yeah. Pie. So 70s, trio y, you know, a lot of jamming, a lot of wah wah pedal. Ugh. To this day, I, I, I can't I can't even step on a wah wah. It makes me sick because I, I OD'd on it in, in hard comfort. Um, um, and that it was in that band that um it was a hard comfort we, we started playing out and we were doing the circuit in la and all the right clubs and rogies and the anti-club and and whatever the roxy and whiskey and all that stuff um but and it was in that it was that process that um i met the the players that ended up getting me into sugar tooth i dated a girl who was in a band called the Love Dolls, Lisa Freeman, and um, they were a very cool, uh, all-female, punk-ish, glamish band, and um, and then she ended up dating the brother of the bass player of Sugar Tooth. And when they used to be called She Died, and when She Died had kicked out their singer because he couldn't sing, what do we do? We need a singer. And the girl that I dated, who's now dating that guy, said, "I, you should mark." And you, he's in hard comfort. And you know, so it came about. It came about that way. And when I 
started in Sugar Tooth, I was not the guitar player. They they had two guitarists already, mm -hmm. Dave Fortman being one of them, and uh, a guy named Tim Groose. And it was just me. And so this, it was a, that was a whole new experience. And I, I didn't really know the guys. I think we'd been on the same bill, but we, they were not friends. And I came into this sort of audition. It was very strange. I never auditioned for anything. And like, and they just went for it. And I, I did my best. Like, well, this is what you do. I sing. I try and make up a melody. That's on the what it was. They, you weren't singing God. material that they already had prepared. Oof. No. Uh-uh. Yeah, I was like, here, here this is kind of like Jane's Addiction. Do something. I'm like, um, okay. Um, but I obviously got it. And then uh, a few months in, Dave Fortman quit to go to Ugly Kid Joe. And I was like, I play guitar? And um, that's how that happened. I was so grateful because I'm just, I just, again, I'm not a singer and I'm certainly not a singer performer. Like I, I I'm not going to be up there doing hot, David Lee Roth, you know, dancing. And it's just not who I am. So, yeah. So <laughs> David Lee, in my dreams, but yeah, um, so that's how it happened. Tell me about how it felt when you first started playing gigs in the legendary clubs of LA, because that is huge. It was tough. Um, you know, there was the pay to play thing, which may or may not right. still exist. I don't even know. But we, I think our first few shows was, were at the Whiskey at Go Go. It was, they were on Sunday night and they were at oh. one in the morning. And I think we had to buy 20 or 25 tickets at five bucks a piece or something. So you come out of pot, you buy all those and you sell them to your friends. And you, who the hell, you know, my parents and four friends are made it out. So those are really tough. Um, very humbling and then we sort isn't of found a way into beautiful the, the, like isn't it wonderful and nurturing ugh. it's just like, it's like an electric this? blanket we started we, yeah in a bathtub yeah we, we found a way we, we started doing bathtub right yeah uh we found a way into some of like the the cooler the anti-club was a really cool punk divey bar, bar club and like uh bebop records in the valley where, you know, record store where they would have, you know, off the grid sort of shows. And so we, we started, we found a way out of that hell hole and English acid was a really cool club, in, uh, West Hollywood. And, and, um, that's where we played with, you know, I just found clippings the other day of, um, rage against machine. Our first show as sugar tooth was opening for rage, which is a new band at English acid. And then a month or two later, we were headlining and Rage was opening for us. Uh, I found both clippings the other day. So, so weird. But yeah, eventually we, we made our way into that, into the right scene and off of Sunset yeah. Strip. But it was, it, it took some figuring out again, because there was no internet. You, what are you going to do? Go. Right. Point yourself mm -hmm. forward and correct as you, when you hit something, turn. <laughs> yeah, pivot. Always pivot. Um, what about when you did start getting those other shows? What is the general vibe? Like, I guess, um, what is your aspiration at that point? Are you thinking, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be Steven Tyler type of life? Or are you thinking, this is fun and my job at the pet shop is awesome? Um, no, yeah, it, it's, uh, again, once I discovered music and it, it not just as a, a, a spectator, but as, you know, a, as a participant, it, there was no turning back. And my, my mom being a school teacher was like, you should get a degree in business. It was a fallback and, and there was no fallback and there's never been a fallback, um, for better, or for worse. There was, it was, this is it. And, um, and of course I did what I had to do to survive and pay rent and, you know, wait tables or whatever, work at tower records or whatever it was, that was fine. Um, did you work at tower it was, on sunset? It was singularly like, I did not on, on sunset. I did, uh, on Ventura and in Northridge. Um, but yeah, though, there was no question in my mind. This, this was it, uh, how it would play out, whether I'd be Steven Tyler or, uh, 
Huey yeah. Lewis. I didn't know, but I yeah. didn't care. Well, that's um, that's the superpower of a twenty-year-old, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, you know, I don't, I, as a parent, I don't know how I'd feel about my kids saying, "There is no, this is it." I'm, I'm like, "Oh God!" But uh, but literally, I mean, I I went to college, I dropped out, I went to this class, I dropped. It's like, you know, it wasn't it wasn't part of who my my genetic makeup uh as certainly it is more so now but not as a uh not as an arrogant uh musician in my you teens. hadn't failed enough yet or struggle yeah you're right but i mean you're you only fail if you stop and and quit everything right if, if you're still going you you're still going that's just it right that's right well the music very world profound. is uh, I was the music like industry the is it's tough because uh, success is measured by finance, right? And sales and whatever. But if you can put a band together and play a show, I think that's, if that's your goal, that's great. You're yeah. I mean, uh, it really is. I mean, there's so many cliches to be had here. Um, and, and I think that the, the journey of an artist is, you know, just pitfall upon pitfall and, 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 um, you know, often failure upon failure. And even if you don't have failure, you're massively successful. Guess what? Just failures right around the corner, right around the corner because you can't no, mean failure that. is digging your grave. So it, every it is moment. A, <laughs> right. And it, I mean, to, and as an artist are, you know, arguably we, all of us are fragile egos anyways, as an artist. So you're like, you know, the journey is just like, oh, you're up, you're, you're this good luck, but you know. But, um, and then you got the, you know, are you, are you, are you using monetary, you know, success as the, the gauge by which you know, are you, are you successful or is it, you know, there, there's so many, there's so much to it and, you know, hindsight, you know, it, it, you know, the cliche that I would use, you know, is, is it's, it's not the end, it's the journey. And, you know, it's, it's like the experiences that I've had that none of my friends had because they went into the right. day jobs or whatever. Like I wouldn't trade those for the world. Even if it was like, you know, my worst show ever was playing for the bartender in Chapel Hill. It was so utterly depressing. So utterly humiliating. Like what have I done with my life? Why did I drive all this way, lug this gear in, kill seven hours in this boring town until the show time, get on stage for the bartender who was booing us. <laughs> was it cat's like, cradle? <laughs> but, but, uh, I don't remember the venue actually. Well, maybe um, that's, but that's but at the same time, like, but that's I or I could be back at Tower Records yeah. or do whatever. You know, I would. It's it's it all becomes part of the fabric of the story of your life, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah, that would be that would be foolish <laughs> and impossible at, at this time. <laughs> um, how long before things? like really started cooking you said that within a couple of months you were opening for rage and then rage was opening for you i remember seeing in 1991 or 92 i was going to see a cult concert irving at the uh, amphitheater and mm -hmm. i saw a tool and it was a, a club show Tool and Rage Against the Machine and the record and the EP were out, but they were brand new. Mm -hmm. They weren't, you know, they weren't yeah. who they are today. Um, yeah. And I tried like hell to convince my friends yeah. to go see that show and, the, and they would not. Um, it, uh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, but, but they were, they were our contemporaries. We were like Rage, Tool, sugar tooth that was we were all uh, you know up and coming around exactly the same time we share the same bills um obviously some, some <laughs> of us went further than others but it was uh when i joined when i joined sugar tooth it was very fast it was it was during the the um, nirvana right. frenzy We're like okay never mind comes out let's sign anybody that sounds anything like anything in the blah 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 so we got we were you know we were together two months we put together i they had you know they had had four or five songs already written that i 
at that point I came in and sang my stuff on it and we sent it around the, you know, send around the cassette kind of a thing. And there was a bidding war. And within a couple of months we were signed to capital would have been the first label. Um, and so it happened very quickly, um, in that band. Um, right. And, and so the rage and for all of us, I mean, the, the rage and the, and the tool thing, um, happened and, and, you know, again, the fragile, um, ego that's also arrogant and, and the, the life of the artist. And like, it was, it's really hard. It was really hard to, um, appreciate the ascent of those bands when you're like, it could have been me and there, there's a competition and, you know, and so you're always judging yourself by the success of tool. Like we, we were on the same bill two months ago. Why are they on? And so it all plays into like the, the, the mental acrobats that uh, I certainly had to go through in that and, and stone temple pilots, you know, uh, I, I, I've toured with stone temple pilots more than any other band on the planet. I, and for me, like, I don't even catch three, four tours. I randomly, we were on the first tour when, when the sex type thing was coming out, we were on tour with them. I remember the very night that their record that they, um, recouped their advance. Like they, it was they like, got an extra pizza and, that night. And then of course they, <laughs> yeah, they got, and they kept going and going and I'm like, Oh my God. And then, um, it was just, yeah. it's really hard because you know, it's, it takes a while to be like, that's their journey. And this is my journey. And would I want to be Scott? Certainly no, not at the moment, you know, but, but not at the moment, but, um, yeah, that's a, that's a hard part of you. being, a you know, creating something that is not a gizmo or a gadget, something that is artistic mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form. Because you have a, a different kind of investment in it. And you also, the delivery system isn't singular. Your widget doesn't, ha it does hang in a store, but you also mm -hmm. travel around and, and offer it up to people and they clap or mm -hmm. not. It's a, it's a real head trip or not. Um, Tell me, yeah. I mean, you've alluded to it a few times and you've also alluded to your diagnosis with ADHD. Tell me uh, how that, how that fucking pendulum affected you in the nineties. Well, I think that n now, now having a label for what it was, um, or it is, you know, what, what, as a musician, what I think happened was not having the attention span to focus. The, the idea of learning how to read was, was way out of my bandwidth, yeah. low read music. <laughs> um, it seemed like, like I might as well, it might, you know, whatever it could be, it, learn how to sure. speak Russian, like, no, not happening. So I think what happened as, as a, 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 a someone with ADHD, uh, once I got the hang of some basic chords and, and, and uh, my, my sense of melody, it, I, I didn't, I walked away from needing to learn anything else. And, um, and a couple of things that what, what, uh, I, I have never been able to sh shred. I've never been a, sh I love, like I could listen to Randy Rhodes every day unbelievable but i've never had the desire to play like him never probably because i can't because it's not part of what i do or i i, I, the, I wouldn't understand the modes and the, uh, what the fuck is going on so i gravitated t more towards neil young as a guitar like sure. a solo player or a, a angus young or uh you know more in the rock as i got as I started evolving, it started going into like new wave and like John McGeoch is one of my all time favorite players. He was in Susie and the Banshees. Um, but it wasn't about proficiency. It was about expression, certainly with Neil Young and McGeoch. And that registered with the ADHD brain. And, 
And I heard a quote, I think I may have talked to you, and it was only recently I heard it. And, and, and it was strangely enough by Steve Vai, one of the most proficient guitar players on the planet. But he said, my advice to guitar players is don't waste time trying to become better at something you're not really good at. Find what you're good at and become the master of that. And that was my approach. I like that. I, I knew how to make dissonant sounds. I, you know, something you just kind of randomly throw your fingers on a, on the fretboard, you hit that, the shit comes out. That works for me. And I don't need the faster value. That doesn't work for me. So I became really proficient at chaos as a guitar player, more so than like technical. And, and I think ultimately it was because I have ADHD. It's an exciting sound though, also, because it's, it's unexpected. Um, you, you get a completely different reaction from the audience when, when you perform in that manner, right? Mm hmm. It's true. Um, it's true. And, and, and for me as a performer, there, there's no, there's no greater joy. I mean, my son, for sure. But like, as an artist, there's no greater joy in my life or have ever been than the moments on stage particularly as a, as a guitar player in some of my bands where I'm just a guitar player where I, the brain shuts off, right? You're not, and particularly like with solos, like, okay, I can solo, but like some of the solos are just chaotic solos. And like those moments when the brain shuts off and it's all instinct and sound and there's, and no two nights are ever going to repeat because the feedback on this amp and the whatever, like, and then it's over and you kind of don't even remember what, what, right. what just happened. And um, there's a pleasure club, another band I was in, we haven't talked about yet, but there's a pleasure club live record that we did um, in New Orleans at, at the Howlin' Wolf. That's, uh, I don't even know, it's, it was released. I don't even know if it's available, but I think I blacked out that whole uh, performance. But listening back to it now, I'm like, like as a guitar player, looking back on what are you most proud of sort of thing, the performance on those five or six songs as a guitar player, like to me, that's, that's, that was me at my best. And that was, it was not. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And it was like, it was like, uh, it's therapy. It's like, it's uh it's, it's meditation. Well, you guys get your deal. You make a record, you go on tour you are still, you're young, you're full of piss and vinegar. You have a hundred ten percent confidence guaranteed. You're going to be, you're going to be huge. At, at, yeah. Huge. I mean, look at those, look at Nirvana. If they, like, if they can do it, so can we, right? Everyone, we all had the same attitude. Like they got signed. Look at that. That guy's, you know. Yeah. He's not like reinventing the wheel. He's just fucking making a really killer wheel. Um, yeah. <laughs> very killer wheel. But tell me about the first, I mean, we we all get our turn getting a, a the smelling salts or slapped with reality or however you want to phrase it. And uh, we're brought back down to earth. And then, you know, we just, we, we pick ourselves back up and take maybe, you know, I'm a slow learner. So I'm, you know, I'm still slugging it out. But <laughs> will you tell me about the first sort of glances into reality that you got? Yeah. Yeah. So the record the record's made. It's going to come out. KNAC, some label, some some station somewhere in the Midwest, I think, starts playing Sold My Fortune and starts spinning and spinning. And now all of a sudden, oh, shit, I think we have the single. Uh, and then KNAC starts playing it in L.A. And it starts, uh oh, I think we better put the record out soon, maybe sooner. And I think maybe we were still deciding what the single would be, but clearly now we know what it's going to be. It comes out. We go out on tour. Everything's great. Stone Temple Pilots. Things are happening. Um, and then the Beavis and Butthead uh, take it on and, and they enjoy it. And that's a very <laughs> surreal experience having um, like the most iconic cartoon characters on the planet talking about 
the song. Like, they're talking about me in the song. Like, what's he singing about? He, he, and that right. he is me. And that was so surreal. So here I am, I'm like, this is really happening. And um, and then the second, in the 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 cursed next single comes out and it doesn't do, it does or do, I don't even know if they had more than like a week. It didn't explode, and he got pulled. So all of a sudden the tour's over. And this, we're a band that was touring like 300 days a year. Like we are monster road warriors, right? Get pulled from the road. And our drummer, Joey Castillo, who is one of the world's Incredible, finest, yeah. uh, goes uh, and joins Danzig. Um, he, he's, he finds an opportunity, then he's not going to let it go. And it's soul crushing, soul crushing because – He's John Bonham, and my bass player Josh, who's still my best friend, is uh, you know, that's the Led Zeppelin rhythm section, and now I've lost. And John Bonham has just died. And I'm not, what the fuck are we gonna do? We had kicked out the guitar player Tim on the road because he would I don't get it. Yeah. It wasn't working. Kushner had come out and joined us because Kushner and, and Joey were tight from the punk yeah. days in Where's LA. The youth? So now Joey's go yeah, Joey's gone. It's me, it's Josh, my bass player, Kushner. But Kushner would, oh, it was kind of, you know, it wasn't really a band member. And it was like, so ultimately we kind of put that on hold. And Josh, my bass player, and I, now we're left. We are Sugar Tooth. What the fuck? Um, and we keep it going. We find drummers that will fill in and work and we hash it out. And we, Get to a point where there is um, the label. Okay, you're ready. We have enough songs to make the second record. And what what do you want to do? And Josh, my bass player, and I, we have no interest in repeating the first record. Like, we've done that. Music has moved on. The culture's moved on. Like, I, being like a hair rock band at that point was just like, I, 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 it's pointless. Like, let's evolve. So we hooked up. Uh, with the Dust Brothers, who had just done, you know, the Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique, and all that, and w as as a band, we'd always listen oh, yeah. to that stuff, and it was, it was the, amazing. Russian's amazing. So we go to the Dust Brothers; they're interested. We're, we become like the first real rock band that they've done. They're certainly a completely different experience than what we'd ever done, and now we're collaborating and we're coming up with these sounds that the, sh the Sugar Tooth, you know, brand has never done before. Whether you like it or not, it's not the first record. I think it's exciting and interesting, but we've got these sketches and now the pressure is on because I have this realization as the singer and lyricist, I have to fucking write a right. hit song because if I don't, this ends and I'm depending on this paycheck. My bass player, Josh, is depending on it. My manager is depending on it. Like everyone's career is depending on my ability to write something that's going to beat sold my fortune. That was, was it a good song? I don't know. Was it the timing? Sure. Yeah. I, I, and I remember having some of the darkest days of my life. I remember turning, I think it was 25 in a drive through of Del Taco on the Highland in Santa Monica like ready to just blow my brains out. They literally depressed to that point. Like it wasn't art for art's sake anymore. It was art for commerce because people yeah. relied on you. And it was so dark. And the Dust Brothers saying, well, if you can't really write lyrics, we can hire somebody. We know somebody can come in and can write lyrics for you. I did it with Vince Neil. And I was like, oh my God, that sounds like hell. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not, that is not, I would rather just walk away. Like no one's going to write my lyrics for me. That's right. my mindset at, you know, 25. But um, we pulled it together. The record, I think I'm proud of the record, you know, a commercial flop, of course. Um, and then of course we get dropped, blah, blah, blah. But it, th that process of, you know, losing the magic of the, the musicianship that we ha had, having to rebuild it and knowing just really knowing there's no way I'm going to recreate the success of the first song. And big. It, it, it was just, it was horrible. And, um, it, yeah, it was just horrible. That was the, that was, that was the moment of like, ah, all, all the dreams came to a halt and like, this is not happening. And how do we get through this and keep our, our pride up? We did it, but it was a really tough process. I think, you know, most of our fans probably walked away. That record was not what they had wanted. Um, 
but it didn't matter because because again if we'd made the for, if we'd made the same record that we had before the label would have dropped us the fans maybe would have liked it, it, it we wouldn't have liked it because it's just like as an artist you don't want to do that but so we, we we made it we made it through with a product that josh and i are both very proud of we hate we hate the album cover but um but the songs we made it and it like hard fought for those songs deep dark moments the lyrics probably reflect that did you but, go out and support that record that and point. how did the how did the contrast of the the two album songs um, come across live. Yeah, we did. We did. Joey came back to do the record with us and it was um, amazing because it felt like, I mean, this, this is the band that was meant to be. It was also a tease because he was flirting with the idea of quitting Danzig and like, this is really the band I want to be in. But the reality is he's not going to walk away from that paycheck for this. So in the end, of course, he didn't quit. And then he goes on to be in Queens of the Stone Age and the Bronx and yeah. Circle Jerks. So he's fine, of course. But Josh and I are left with like, oh, shit. Now we've got this record and no drummer again. So we found an incredible drummer. His name is Dust Dusty Watson and um, a truly an amazing drummer. He um, His love was surf, surf music. So he was instrumentalist. But he could play Joey's parts like a monster. And he went on tour. We toured that record. The first single was called Booty Street, um, and it did. It started to do well. Um, very different departure from from So My Fortune, but it seemed like, oh shit, maybe we have a part two to this, and we kind of did. Um, but then Geffen got by, bought by Seagrams, and the soul of the collapse, and everyone in the radio department, which were allies, were now fired. And yeah. you're the victim of this thing, and uh, why I'll never sign with a major label in my life again even if I had the choice, which I don't. Um, but yeah, so, so we came, we came home after round two. It's like, this isn't right. working. How, I mean, that's a, that's a rough feeling because this is something that you've nurtured for years. You've poured a lot into it. Are you, are you being a, uh, are you are you behaving as a cliche and just catching it on fire and walking away as a young man or or are you like let's just put it on the back burner and do some other stuff and maybe we'll come back to it like how how uh, how reasonable and mature do you think you handled it you know i think we were okay like again there was no doubt in my mind that i was that I'm at that point that I'm an artist. This is like, you know, died in the wool, but, but sugar tooth felt like an albatross around our necks at this point. It was like, a, we are, you know, our, our name was, was an embarrassment to the Geffen label, whatever it was. That's, that's what we felt. So, um, but what had happened was the dust brothers had, had taken a shine to us as people and us, them, and, and they taught us how to, record and sample and uh, which you know, at the time was certainly newish yeah. and cutting edge in the rock world it was like the, the second sugar tooth record was arguably one of the first few records that married uh the sampling and the rock bands together you know other bands like they had more success and highlight how many songs in your catalog do you have um, really telephone voicemail on that was a thing do you have one huh tell no it I like a voice, voice message what do you mean? on an answering machine voice message. Do you remember that was a, oh, very, no, I don't that was have a very popular trend for a while? Very popular. Yes, but that's not my jam, you know. No. Um, but what had happened was so so we'd gotten this this skill together. We were making we were make, we were doing this Latin band called Sangre de Toro, Sangre de Toro, with our friend Gus, who's a fantastic singer, and it was the goal was to make it like Portis Head. Uh, meets maybe the Latin Playboys and uh, sort of taking from my love and roots of, of Latin music. We were making this really interesting, really cool thing. It was Latin. It was all Spanish. That cool. And dot, dot, dot. There was a, uh, a legendary band in LA called yeah. Thelonious Monster. And 
Bob Forrest is a Thelone, as a is a is a legendary. He was a singer. He's a singer, and he's he's a legend in L.A. He had just gotten sober, or had been sober a handful of years, and was just getting back into. He wanted to make a record, and friends of friends put us together. Like I know these guys are now like young producers, and they're they're kind of like samples, and they're different, but they come from rock. And he was like, "Let's put us." You know, so they put us in touch with Bob, and Bob, I'd been seeing Bob as a Thelonious, as a kid, Thelonious Monster. Um, so he was like, oh shit, like I'm meeting an idol. And uh, we ended up producing the record. It became a band called The Bicycle Thief. And his guitar player is now a legend named yeah. Josh Klinghoffer. Don't you think that and it's ironic that Josh, Josh Blum and I was with Bob and ended up in the Peppers and also John w was almost in Thelonious Monster, right? John was right? a Thelonious Monster. Yes, he was. That's, you it, should have been in the Chili yep. Peppers, man. Um, you, should, you, see, you see that? You're thinking like I'm thinking. No, so we we produced this record, and it's uh, we were very – Josh Blum and I are very, very proud of it. Um, it was a lot of work. Bob is a, a, a dear friend at this point, but but a, a, a challenging artist to work with. And, uh, and it was on a shoestring dime. I think we had $8,000 right. to make the record. And Josh Klinghoffer was uh, seventeen or eighteen at the time, just just you know living at home with his parents, and but still an incredible player and recognizably so. And so we made this record. It got put out on Golden Voice Records, um, and I went on tour with with them, opening for the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Foo Fighters and Concrete Blonde. I was, so I was the I was the extra guitar player, and you know we were playing ten thousand seaters every six weeks and, wow. and all that, and that was great. Um, and so that's what I had going on. I was, we were looking at production, and and I that's when I roughly around the time that uh, Nevada Bachelors and we I don't remember how we heard your tape, but we'd heard it like this is fucking good, and we reached out. We thought at the time we thought maybe we could use our connections with Geffen and uh, like bring it in and help and. Obviously, that didn't quite pan out, but we had good intentions. Um, yeah, it was around that time that was uh, that the Pleasure Club James Hall thing. How did that out. come together? So um, James Hall, um, also a bit of a legend, but in the Gothic oh. South. Um, uh, music scene, a criminally under celebrated. Artist. He Criminally, yes. Yeah. So, so his first record as as James Hall, I mean, pretty terrible production and, and and all, but it's 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 really good. The songwriting is really really strong, and um, he put out a record on Geffen, which was the label we were we were on. And one day we would Josh Blum, my bass player, and I would go to the Geffen like you would do, and you yeah. raid their closet of all the CDs, and you you go sell them at the local whatever and you make 50 you 100 bucks and you go week. eat <laughs> right but there's one day i for some reason which is so that i never did i was like ah, i want to listen to this this cd before i sell it what if it's good and the first song comes on and it's called pleasure club and it's just thumping bass and it kind of little come build and there's a little vocal and, it's, and then bam it explodes and he's maniacally singing like nick cave having a convulsion and you're like what the fuck is this i've never heard like oh my god so i went to go see well is he playing live yes and my friend i got all my all all of a sudden all my friends are in this record it, it, it's uh it's it's a right it's great so we would go see him and he was unbelievable he was he was a you know somewhere between Bowie, Nick Cave, and uh, sure. James Brown as a performer, like androgynous, sexual, high energy. What is going on? Incredible. So, fast forward a few years, I had said to somebody, if I were ever to step down at this point in my life, step down as a singer, it would be to play bass in that fucking band. Bass and I went to go see him once at the Mint. Very specific. No, you said bass you say, you say? specifically. Bass? No, no. No, no. I said uh, if I were ever to step down as a singer, it would be yeah. play guitar. Okay. In that. Okay. 
And um, I went to go see him at the Mint, and he had this great, I mean, solid musicians, for sure. Studio musician quality. Again, like the, the difference between the shredder and sure. me and not being. And it, it didn't work for me. And I walked up to Mr. James Hall afterwards. I think it might have been my first and only time meeting him at that point. And I said, my name is Mark, and I'm a fan. And you have uh you're playing oh, I said something like you're playing with studio musicians and you should be playing with the stooges and if you ever want a guitar player that plays like the stooges call me and i gave him my, my number a card and he fucking called me and and then Fortune i was like oh, shit, did bowl. i say i would step down as a singer <laughs> and um uh, so this is, what I, this is like what I talk about in my, my normal life is that my day job and all that. Like there was, there was a, a sign on a bus, maybe it was subway, maybe it was both years ago. And it was, it was about a fucking shoe company ad. It was stupid, but it, it was so true. And the, the slogan was no great story ever started with, it was raining. So I stayed in, right? Everything that's ever happened in my life is because I got myself out of the fucking house. It's never been about my talent. It's about who I met because I was there at the right time at the right, everything, all the great things in my life, meeting my wife. It's because I got off the sofa, whether I wanted to or not. And I put myself out there. It was ne again, never about my talent, the right place, right time. And so I think about that. Yeah. So I was, at, I, I actually remember not wanting to go to the show that night. I was tired. I was probably right. stoned. Oh God. And I went and like, oh, I was kind of intimidated. Do I talk to the guy? Ah, what the fuck? So here, I, so then he calls me and there I am. And I got, I got the job and, uh, did what you have an, an audition or did he just on good faith say, so you can, you, you can play like, uh, you can play the Stooges? No. He, okay, uh, <laughs> come on. He, there was an audition. I went to. I went to the house, I went to his manager's house and he had assembled like a, he had like two guitar players and I was and all this music drummer and that. And it was very calculated, and I, you know, he's very chordal and I, you know, so I'm trying to learn these chords, you know, I'm, what is this? But I, you know, I figured it out and, and it didn't, it didn't do it for him. He, I don't know. He was, well, I wasn't what he was looking for, but, um, I like, he liked me enough to we stayed in touch. I was in another band in the time called Twig, who later became the Nervous Return. They're a good band. But I was at a band called Twig. We were playing in a place called Silver Lake yeah. Lounge. And at that point, Grant, who's the bass player in Pleasure Club, was out in LA. They were coming to start to form the band. And James said, hey, my friend Mark's playing. And so like, what do you want? I go see him? Sure. And it was at that show that I apparently, uh, they what they saw on stage was like, holy shit, what is that? Uh, why is he right. not in the band? And it was it was so that was that ended up being the audition. It was my performance in Twig that Grant turned to James that he needs to be our guitar player, and that was how it happened. I failed the actual <laughs> audition, but I got the job. Do you think? Uh... <laughs> because you were in a more comfortable environment that it also affected your performance? Or do you think that just the material and, you know, learning those weird, you know, chords were, was tough. Yeah. I, was, I think it's all of it. I mean, you know, I, I was doing what I thought James had wanted to and me to do in the recording. Like the, the, they were already recorded. They were very precise parts. So I was trying to mimic those parts. And when you do that, it's really hard to, to be like unchained or unhinged in your performance. You're like, it's this chord. And, and, and when I was in doing the thing with twig, like those were our songs. I, those were my parts. And here I, you know, me letting go and feedback and bashing guitars, whatever I was doing, like, that was my baby. So I, there was, there was, I was, there was, you know, uh, it was unhinged and, and, uh, that's it. That's like the difference to make an LA reference. Yeah, so it's that's very like the difference between being uh, doing a press conference and doing a monologue, right? Like you were just being yourself. Yeah. Just being this myself. And, uh, again, it's, it, that's, it, it, I am not a, 
educated, proficient musician, and I never will, and it's not my strength, but I am, I, I, my arrogance does, I do think that I'm a really good guitar player, and I, I, I but it's, it's not for everybody. It's, it's, it's a, you know what I mean? It's like, could I be a studio musician? Hell no. Right. I couldn't, but I, I, I could be a, I can pee in the stooges. God, wouldn't that be killer? So it there's sure a, would. there's sure. a market difference between the pressure of being the center, the front person, the singer, guitar player, and being a support character in a stage presentation, right? So how yeah. how freeing did that feel? That must have felt pretty good. You all of a sudden you're like, "Holy shit, I'm in this band that I adore and I get to be myself and I don't have the pressure of being a singer." Was there any sort of letdown in that like, "Well, I'm not the singer anymore." Or was it really a weight off your shoulders and allowed you to focus? Yeah, well, it was it was a huge weight because it was really the first time as a you know other than like you know my first couple months in hard comfort as a kid, my first time not being the singer. And again, as I said from the beginning, I don't consider myself a singer. I can sing kind of, but I'm not a singer. And, and, you know, when we were on tour with Sugar Tooth, I was always so bummed because, you know, we afterwards, as, as a young band will do, you go out and you drink and you party and you party. But I had my voice right. and I had to keep it, you know, and everyone's drinking and smoking. I was worried. What if, I got a radio performance. What are the, that shit was gone for one. <laughs> um, James, you know, James was um, like like the consummate performer. So like, I could never touch that. And like, he was like, he needed no coaching. And what it afforded me, I think you and I talked about it when when that drive we had the other night. But um, it afforded me, you know, th th it's a thing to sing and play the guitar. And there is, you know, m I became really good at like s finding the open spaces to sing and, and not play and, and accent. I became a really good accent player when I would sing. And now my job was to fill in the space in a way that I never had to do before. And not being, you know, that proficient guy and not having a second guitar. Well, James would play guitar too sometimes, but often I was just the, the one guy. I had the opportunity to really explore soundscapes and I was never really a pedal guy before. And now I got to do things with delays and, and, you know, sounds and, and, you know, I was playing in pleasure club. I was playing hollow bodies so and unlike in pleasure and sugar tooth, it was, you know, SG. So I was having a hollow body going through a Marshall stack or half stack with, you know, overdrive. And so I, it became just like a fucking playground for me. And like, what can I do that can be so obnoxious and yet just work within the context of a song? And James and Grant, they were like, go for it. Like whatever we saw you do on, on stage with Twig, just do it. And so I just went, I was in, I was like a pig and shit. I was so happy. And uh, I became, like I was telling you, I, I became the guitar player that I always wanted to be in that band where I, I broke new ground for me. I, I tried, um, chords and, uh, rhythms and, um, sounds that I never did or could explore maybe in sugar tooth because I was just the player. And, and, um, well, and that was awesome. You were unencumbered was really, by the microphone I mean, so at your face, right? So you could, you had more than twice the energy to focus on being creative on the guitar. That's exciting. And the feedback situation with the hollow body and a half stack, well, that's different every night, too. So you're not. Yeah. A I mean, feedback that's a, that's like, part isn't a consistent night, part. Right? It's, a, it's a living part of a song at that point if there's a part where you're like i'm gonna just take my fucking hands off on this part and see what happens yeah i mean yeah that's it and uh 
like the, 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 the pleasure club, the live record, I think it's called out of the pulpit. Um, when I was like, that's, oh my God, that's, but yeah, it would be, as we were talking, the, uh, you take the hand off the guitar and you look at the amp and all of a sudden there's a feedback and you put your hands back, the feedback goes away. You take it off a little bit. It's almost like a theremin and, and you start working with that and you can make that into this monstrous, like demonic swirl. It, it just like, oh my God, where has this been all my life? And yeah, it, that I, I, it, I never thought I would go back to a, a solid body guitar again. Like this is, this is where I was meant to be. Um, how, yeah. so tell me about your, a, your first show with the band and a little bit about your experience in the band and tell me about your last show. I am, I, I can't exactly remember the first show. I think our first show was at the Dragonfly in uh, in Hollywood, um, and it was a big deal. It was uh, Marilyn Manson was there. Uh, he was a fan of James pr previously. Marilyn Manson, like my old A and R guy from Geffen, was there. Uh, all like, James was was famous in like a cult way, like other musicians love James. So everyone was out. Was, I think it was sold out. And um, it was, uh, it was great. And it was, uh, I, I might have it wrong. We might've played out of state first before we, we, we made our big entrance into LA, but that's my memory of it. And I remember, the, I remember my old A&R guy saying, I haven't seen a sh the last time I saw a show like that was Nick yeah. Cave and uh, in the bad seeds. And I'm like, oh my God, I, you, I love you. Um, the last show, <laughs> the last show, well, okay. The, la the last show was actually right when COVID hit. So oh. we, uh, we had a terrible last show somewhere in like Wisconsin or something. It, the band, had, you know, we, hated it. the classic form where everyone was fighting and it was just dysfunctional at that point and we had a terrible show at the wrong venue to, to appease some booker and it was just like oh fuck that's how it went fuck you we walked away a handful of years later we got back together we recorded uh, an ep uh, two singles and then we have an ep and we put some shows we we're going to do some shows in 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 uh atlanta which is where the band was based at that point and it was a small theater, Smith's, we probably played Smith's a million times. And I think we'd sold out a couple nights there. Uh, we were sort of famous in that, in that town a little bit. Um, and that was great. And we did one more show, it was at the Earl. I think that was, we, it was our last show, the Earl. And it was right when, it was the night before the, like the lockdown had started or something and, and you know, my drum, my guitar, uh, Grant, the bass player is vomiting, uh, on, uh, on stage, backstage. He's not feeling well. The audience is probably half full because they're scared shitless of catching this, this new disease and, and arguably, you know, you know, rightly so. And, and, uh, we did it. It was fine. It was good. I think I was great. <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, there were, there were, there were more shows meant to happen and we just pulled the plug because of COVID. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I, I, my arrogance coming out, but we were, we were legendary. We were, uh, we were, you didn't want to share a bill with, with pleasure club. We would absolutely destroy, destroy it. And, uh, you know, I, 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 there were many times when the bands would ask us to, to the headliners would ask us to swap spots with them because they didn't want I to. I saw one of my, one and, of my favorite bands, it, that feels good. uh, play South by Southwest. And I came to see them. I think that they played after you guys. I feel like I caught a last show and they were terrified and they were a ferocious live band, you know, and they were just like, fuck. And they, and they were forever fans after that also. I mean, that's it. And, and, and that's, that's the beauty of that band and all bands. It's so much more like I'm arrogant about it. I'm confident, but it was so much more right. than me, right? It was our drummer, Michael Jerome, untouchable world-class drummer, uh, you know, James performances, like Grant, like the stoic, maniacal, 
bass thumping bass. Like it, it, it was a performance piece at with musicianship at the highest level. So it was, it was a, it was a thing. It was not just me. It was like, you know, it, it, if one of us had left, it would have been right. just pointless. Did, and there was a break in there though. Yeah. In the band. Yeah, there was a break at the end. I think we ended officially maybe 2003 and then we redid it. I forget maybe five years ago. We, you know, the, the animosity had faded and the egos had tempered and the, you know, it's tough. <laughs> Being on the road is tough. You're, you're married to a bunch of, yeah, you're right. You're married to a bunch of people and they're bringing their baggage into the van and the whatever and you are and they're fighting and then there's money involved. In it our ego is oh it's you know it's, it, the a band ever lasts longer than a couple yeah. of years is amazing no it's incredible that's success but you made it right, through rehearse right. you made it through enough rehearsals to get to a show you're a success congratulations <laughs> here's your participation <laughs> trophy right. there you go. uh when did you move to new york and did you live in El in atlanta for a while no, I never lived in Atlanta. I, I I sort of was on and off in New Orleans for for a couple of years when when the band was based there. Uh, I moved to New York in two thousand and four. The end of two thousand and four, um, my uh, oh, I got in a divorce and I was looking for an opportunity to reinvent my life, so I moved out here and uh, been here ever since. This is an interesting part of your story because. Up until this point, I mean, I don't, I don't, re, I, I don't presume to know everything about you, but you haven't sold five million records. You probably, um, I've sold, I've sold I, tens same. of records. <laughs> um, I, you know, I know that back then record deals were, you know, it, it, the the climate wasn't any less harsh for for an artist, but there was money that was offered up. So if you were smart, you could squirrel stuff away, but you had to, you must've gotten to New York and hit the ground running. You had a job. What, uh, what were you doing? Well, I didn't have a job when I first decided to move here. I was, it was, uh, you know, it was tough. I, I don't like name people, but my wife had left me for Josh clean. Fucker Josh. So you fucker I produced. Right. So I produced this <laughs> record, you know, so now, so LA is extra tainted for me. So I, 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 I'm like, I'm moving. I'd always loved New York. Always wanted, I felt inspired by it. Like exciting. I'd lived in LA my whole life. I wanted like the opportunity to try something new. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to New York. I'm moving. I don't have a job. I don't have friends. I don't know what's going to happen there. And, um, I was out to dinner with a friend of mine. I said, I'm moving, you know, and she's like, oh my God, there's a job opening up. And she, at that dinner, she called her boss and put me on the phone and, and the job opens up and it's mine. And I'm, so I'm moving to LA with uh, New York without a job, but before I actually get on the plane, I've now got the job. And so I moved to New York and it's uh, at ASCAP and, um, and I've been at ASCAP been there for at, almost know, 20 years, then. many years now. Probably more. Mm -hmm. So you didn't go to college. You. Mm -mm. I did. Well, did, oh, later you, did life, you go yes. to school uh, during. Oh, when after you got to New York. Aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I'm, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to piece together, you know, the situation where uh, you get a job at ASCAP and I'm trying to like. I don't know what that job is, but it's probably not, uh, you're probably not like, uh, tell them, you know, you probably don't have people working under you at that point. Yeah, no, at that, so I, I am, I'm like a, you know, for lack of a better term at that point, like an a and i I'm, I'm the outward, I'm the, one of the, you know, the crew that go out and see the shows and the deal, find the bands and sign them up and, and, you know, the relationships and, and I love it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm new to New York and the, the bars close at four in the morning and the bands are everywhere. I'm in the Lower East Side and it's LCD sound system. It's, you know, it's, it's just, it's thriving and it's incredible. And, and that was um, a good time for music. 
and that's where I, I started. And that was a great time. And, and at the same time, I, when I got off the road with Pleasure Club, I realized just how isolated I had been in my life. It had been so singularly music focused, which was great in many ways, but also like, detrimental and everything else. I didn't realize you couldn't, I couldn't have talked to you about any wars that we were in or political. I just, I knew nothing. And I thought, this is really embarrassing. I'm, I'm in my, my early thirties at this point, like I'm a moron. I'm, I'm, you know, so I started reading, I was reading, I thought for some reason, I thought I would start, start with the classics. I loved, I was reading Jane Eyre. I was reading like the Bronte stuff. And, and then my wife, Melissa said, as long as you're reading, like, why don't you go to school and finish your degree? And uh, mm. so I did, and I chipped away at it. And in the last, you know, I, I graduated, I forget, maybe six years ago with a political science degree. Um, for no other reason, just because I wanted it. I obviously has no yeah. impact on my career. Um, but, uh, but I've been at ASCAP and I now I run the department, the, the, the pop and rock membership department. I have uh, a staff in LA in New York and, um, and uh, it's an amazing company. It's an amazing job. And it's, it's really, it's something I believe in because why? Because we represent and fight for the songwriters. Like, because I right. in that. Proud ASCAP member. Hey, can you get me some extra? Yeah, absolutely. Are you? Well, just, yeah, Not what much. You Let's see what we got. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. Yeah. I think, um, <laughs> you know, pro once a year I can get my, I can get a, some, a lunch maybe. No extra pizza for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Well, I'm sorry. Um, that, you know, that is a that is a different approach to the same situation. And, you know, you, you came, you approached that job with a lot of experience as from what I'm, what I've learned, you've uh, started bands, you've made records, you've toured, you produced other records and, and you went and you were a member of a band. And so, do you think that you could have done that job or you could have fulfilled the requirements of that position if you if you didn't embody all of those experiences? Yeah, I mean I do. I do think so. I mean I think that my 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 staff and and my colleagues all over the over the years, I think very few of them were musicians and they 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 got the job. I think again, right place, right time. I put myself out there. I ask questions. I do. You, you know anybody? It, it's again luck and timing, not not skill. I know. I um. I think that in the end, I, I maybe have done well in the career because of my I, like maybe how I I relate to other artists and they like me and you know maybe that plays into it a little bit. But um, but you know I think that. It was certainly not right. a requirement, you know, the, the being in bands and, and uh, it was it was more about my relationships that I, you know, I knew I knew the guy that had hired me from years, years, I, you know, years before that, when I was in L.A., I was like lost. I didn't want to wait tables. I was depressed with sugar tooth. And blah. I, my neighbor said, hey, I know a guy that manages tool. He also works at uh, ASCAP. You should meet him. So I. Oh introduced me and I went into ASCAP years and I met the guy and, and those were the seeds that sort of got me to where I was. But again, it's just, it's, it's it amazes me sometimes. Again, everything that's so great in my life has happened. Happenstance, putting yourself out there, truly not about talent or I, I didn't go to school for it and I got it. I didn't put in the work to get this and I got, it's because it was the right, right place at the right time. Yeah, I mean, you have to, and your willingness to be there, your willingness to like present yourself. You can be in a room and still keep your mouth shut and not get what you want or, or need, or even what you are, what is possible, like the possibilities are nipped in the bud. Right? Yeah. It's true. It's so true. So. <sighs> And now you have new recordings, of course. Mm. So, so 
during the during the, the a few years before the pandemic hit, I got re, uh, some guy reached out to me from Australia. He was, we wanted to uh, do a documentary on the music scene, the grunge music scene, and uh, the implosion of most bands, and wanted to know if we would be a part of it. So I agreed to it. And Josh Blum in in the LA at the time, and Joey Castillo, we all agreed to it. So we're in this film, and it's all these bands. It's Orange Nine Millimeter. It's uh, it's. Uh, white zombie and and uh, quicksand blah 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 and it came out during the pandemic it's called underground ink and one night melissa my wife was a sound asleep my son was sleeping and i'm on the sofa you know depressed isolated in this new york apartment alone the world's collapsing everyone's around me dying there's bodies being you know ushered to the hospital at every given moment on the streets in front of me i put on this documentary and here here i am all bloated talking about the implosion of my band and uh and every band's the same fucking story and i thought god it's so utterly depressing that they i'm this cliche that we weren't nirvana the label gobbles up and now we're we gave up we walked away there was a band or two in there that didn't i forget well, which quicksand, one was presumably this you know, Quick, quick sound, yeah, they certainly didn't, but they weren't the one that one of them or two. They they went from the major label to like we're doing it ourselves. Clutch we're still doing it, and that was the one. I think the band it was maybe it was. Clutch is, a, is been, one of those bands. They just thought, they don't stop, yeah. and they you know the, the, uh, it's incredible. It's admirable. It is admirable, and it was also inspirational, and that's what got me. It, I think it was Clutch, and I said. I don't want to be that fucking cliche. So I texted Josh, I texted Joey. I'm like, we're all alive. We're all friends. We're all still musicians. What if we put Sugar Tooth back together? We make a record, no label, no manager, no publishing company, no hope in the world of a radio single. And we write songs like we did when we were teenagers in our bedrooms at home for no other reason than to just write songs and get it out. They said, yep, let's do it. And uh, so it was that movie that did it and it was clutch that did it and uh we wrote songs like it was it was fucking easy so easy because here we were with i mean there was what more does a songwriter need i mean look around you this is the world is like it anything you want to talk yeah. about it's happening right here and uh and i tapped into a, a part of my songwriting that i think we talked about before but it's never i never had as a, as a as a kid i didn't have the life experiences to reference you know, other than like isolation depression drug you know escapism and all that that was my those those were the first two records this is this is a record of like anger uh fear political unrest my son the future of the planet like the war ukraine russia like it's all there and now i have the, the 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 wisdom and the 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 skill set to write songs like that they're still abstract enough where like it's not blunt like oh this is about the ukraine right. or the bombing it's still i still like approach it with some sort of uh abstractness uh, but but it's very much uh storytelling in a way that i never had so anyways cathartic thank you clutch i owe you what what a bunch of dudes let me ask you this do you feel like I mean, obviously, a lot of people find inspiration in their songwriting from struggle. And Elvis Costello famously said that he would, you know, create drama in his life so that he had inspiration. Um, and that, you know, there's that's whatever about that. But how, um, at this point in your life, you have a, a career and some security. So the the like i'm eating ramen every night and angry stuff like that's that's gone but i'm wondering if you think that your time studying and getting your degree and uh and your professional life like ha your experience communicating if that informed your ability to express yourself um not uh thematically but just technically um maybe i mean i think i think at that you know the point that we wrote this last the sugar tooth 
volume three record, um, which is coming out, I think. Is that a Sabbath reference? This month. Um, I love that. It is a Sabbath record, but it's also yeah. third record. And it's also, it's all about volume and loud and, you know, it, was, it all made sense. But anyways, um, I have 40 years at that point of, of songwriting in me and, and a uh, turn of phrase and, and metaphors versus the 15 or 10 years I had in, in my twenties. And, you know, certainly books like I, I, you know, so in volume three, some of the lyrics I was reading, um, Moby Dick at the time. And I was, there's a couple lines in the chorus of one of the songs that I just pulled right out of Moby Dick. And, and, um, so there's literary, literary reference, but also, you know, working at ASCAP and working with songwriters, um, for 20 years, some of the finest songwriters on the planet, whether you like the music or not, it's pop music, it's country music, whatever, but like, these are, are real craftspeople and working with them, learning from them, I think, you know, uh, how do you tell a story? How do you make, say this without actually saying that? I think by osmosis, I, I, I probably got a lot of that from them too. And, and I think that the life experience is like, I didn't have to create the drama. Like my mother died from COVID. My, my two people that I adored very much died from COVID. Uh, I was in bed for two weeks with COVID. I'm worried about at the, at this point, like the food chain collapsing, sure. I've got a five-year-old in the bedroom next to me. How, what what if I can't feed him? Like the those real. I live on an island. I'm in Manhattan, an island. Like what if the food chain collapses? Like I've seen this movie before, no. and it doesn't end well. Like that <laughs> that that like was the stage for like Volume Three record, and so I think all that came together, and I'm extraordinarily proud of of the work as a songwriter, musician, and all in the band, and I love it. But as a as a songwriter, a lyricist, they, to me, I think I, I this is my peak. This record, and I have more piss and vinegar now than I did in my twenties. And my voice when I was trying trying that find that rasp, and I was pathetically sounding like Lemmy. I actually have the voice I wanted. Like somehow my voice got stronger and raspier and it didn't, it didn't become softer and wimpier. And I'm <laughs> so grateful. Um, you have two, two singles out now, right? Three, three. You got to get oh. your shit. Three. Yeah. We do three and singles and three videos. When, do you have a release date for the record? Uh, we do. I embarrassingly don't remember what it is because I think we push it back, but it is this month. There's a fourth single coming out called Shelter, and it will coincide with the release of the album. Um, and then we'll see. You know, I don't know. We'll, I, we would love to play shows. Um, we don't have a drummer at this point. Joey is committed to the Bronx and uh, Circle mm -hmm. Jerks and whatever he's doing. So we, we're, you know, I don't know if there's an appetite for us to perform live. I hope that there is, um, but we would love to. And, but, you know, at the end of the day, we'll talk about the, like the, the measure of success and, and all that. Like when, when we were getting ready to put this record out, our old manager, Brian, yeah. you know, Clint, Brian Klein, Scout E had this meeting with us and he said, let me help you put this record out. Um, your part, I, I consider you part of my heritage. You managed, you know, way back in the day, and and I, this record's really good. And let me just help you. And Josh, my bass player, and I were so grateful because you know, although I work in the music industry and I advise all day long, it's a very different experience when it's yours. And I felt like lost. And they helped sort of set us up and get this thing out. And I had a, you know, the the two. It, the management company, uh, Evan and, and Brian and Josh Blum and I got on the phone as we will like every week or two to sort of catch up. And it was, it was on the first week and this, the first single was out and the, we were getting like a thousand views a day. So maybe it was at seven or 8,000 by the end of the week. And I was in tears and I thanked Brian in tears. I was so emotional because I didn't care if that, if it ended right there, the fact that we, the band got together, put out a record that we're both so proud of and that anyone got to hear it, let alone 8,000 people at that point, like I'm done. Like anything else here is just, just like, 
cherry, you know, whipped cream or whatever the, the, the phrase is, but like emotional, super emotional and super grateful. And, and as I'm watching the singles come out and like, you know, we're not exploding and it. And then like the joke, like, we're not, we're not timely. This isn't like fashionable music. It is what it is. And, but like that there are still people out there that are moved by it. it there is no greater. It's a, it's my, my, my ultimate boss is Paul Williams, the songwriter, actor, uh, he's the president of ASCAP and he calls that kind of stuff, a heart payment. Right. It's a heart royalty. And when I, when I get, you know, interaction from friends or fans, or even just watch the, you know, the, 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 the views on YouTube grow, like that's a heart payment, man. And, and th there is no, th there's no money coming in from that. And I don't give a shit. Like I am so just so grateful to have art as a form of expression and to have been able to go to the guitar during COVID and whenever, when I was at my height of fear and panic and stress to be able to hold that thing, pull it into my chest, play it, close my eyes and have that be how I could express myself was a gift that I stumbled upon as a kid. And it's been obviously a lifelong. So it's all like, again, the journey and the measure of success. I don't quite how to, how to, to verbalize it, but it's all there. I'm experiencing it now. I'm incredibly grateful for it. I'm talking to you. Who the fuck wants I to hear do. from me? You're talking to you. And, and it's like, oh my God, it's, it's just, this is, it's great. I'm not religious in any sense, but if I were, a, you know. <laughs> You'd get a crucifix tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get it all, bringing it all the way back. Um, well, uh, I mean, what you're talking about is a realization of that feeling you had sitting there watching that movie, isn't it? It's a realization of this can't be the end of the story. And now here we are. The story's still going. My, my, my dear friend, Will Langoff said it, and I probably said this to you before, but he, I was trying to verbalize like, why I'm putting the band back together. He says, because you don't want the story of sugar tooth to end with a dot, dot, dot. You want it to end Fuck with an yeah. exclamation point. That's it. What about shows? If we could find a drummer, I'm going to find you. We'll I'm do it. Find you but you know, it's strategically, strategically, like I, I don't We don't go on. I have no desire to go on tour uh, at this point. But like, if there was a one off or a festival, we we would do it. As long as you know, I I I don't have any interest in playing uh, for playing in front of the bartender in uh, Chapel Hill. Yeah, you've already done it. That would be uh, you know that would be a step Point backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. It's no way. Anyway. I'm going to help find you a drummer. I mean, Please there do. Are... We've got some feelers out. We've got some. We've got some correspondence going, but like one guy just didn't respond. The other guy did respond, and then didn't show up for the call. It's like you know, there. Here I am again. Right. I know this story, but but uh, but we're very obviously a band like this. It's very the drummer is almost the core of the band. Like you know, it has to be. A drummer who can find, who can play and bash, but have a groove, and and you know, I know I'm a guy. For I know another guy. The like his, um, yeah. I'll talk. I'll talk to you about it when we stop recording. And uh, okay. yeah, I think he it could, uh, it could be great. He's a New York guy. Lives in Brooklyn. Yeah, I love him already. Hello, um, ready. Does he have I'm, a swimmer's uh, book? I'm so stoked to get to hear. I mean, I know that this is sort of like the footnotes of your life, but uh, you have a great story. And it's a story that, um, you know, it's inspiring because you can, you've continued to, to put yourself out there. And by putting yourself out there and taking chances, and all of it, you've gotten opportunities continuously. And, um, you know, from hanging out with you, talking with you over months now, um, I, I don't see any sign of you, Painful, isn't it? you know, killing that part of yourself anytime soon. So I think that uh, I'm excited to see what Sugar Tooth does in the next year, two years. And... I mean, I don't know. Also, Pleasure Club. I don't know if you guys have any conversations about doing stuff in the future, but 
damn. Who knows? Yeah, we're all we're all still in touch. We're all still friends. I mean, that's that's the beauty of it, right? You never know. There's no, especially when you're not on a label. There's no pressure. Like you create when you want to create. That's a, it's a wonderful time to be alive. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so grateful to be on this. Thank you for uh, asking me. And um, it's uh, it's nice to talk about myself. I don't really usually do that. But uh, next time I'll interview uh, nobody you. Nobody wants to hear about me. Yeah. Oh, come on. Have you ever done a couch riff uh, flipped, flipped around? No. I've appeared on other people's podcasts. Why not? You know, but. It's not the same, is it? I mean, sort of. Just think about it. <laughs> Maybe. We'll we'll negotiate. We'll negotiate. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank All you right. so much. Thank you for um I heard your your uh your beautiful family come in. I've got to hang out with all you guys. Yeah. Did you? Um at, so please yeah. tell them that I said hello. Um, I will. He's a drummer and That's he's excellent. awesome. What are you going to do when he's like, I'm not going to college. I'm going to be, I'm going to go. I'm the new drummer in the Rolling Stones. They're still going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah. I don't know. That's a really interesting uh, question. Cause I, part of me is like, Oh my God, I fear that moment. And yet I look back at my life. Like I wouldn't have changed. I mean, I, I wouldn't change any of it. What a, what a fantastic experience being a musician is. And then like your son says, I want to be a musician. Like, Shit. Shit. But of course I will support yeah. whatever. I believe you. I mean, you you both have music and you both work with musicians. So maybe that's maybe you're like, listen, I work I work with musicians. There are a lot of pitfalls. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. It's a fucking minefield out there, kid. Um uh, thank you again. I I I I wish all of the best shit for you always. Thank you. Same to you, buddy boy. <laughs>